Hello everyone. We are going to meet together again today to continue our study in Hebrews. As we do that, let's pause and pray first of all. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you that we can meet together to study your word. As we do so, Lord, just guide and direct us in our thoughts and in our studies. Just open our eyes to your words. And Lord, challenge us with your word as well as to where we are and what we are doing for you. So Lord, thank you and continue with us now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So thanks folks for meeting together this way. Um, this is the third of our studies. Uh, the day is Wednesday the 30th of September. And as I said, we're going to uh, be looking at Hebrews chapter 3 this evening. We might get the whole way through it, we may not, doesn't matter. But let's look at it together. So let me read to you, first of all, some of the opening verses, down from verse 1 down to verse 10. So, dear brothers and sisters who belong to God and are partners with those called to heaven, think carefully about this Jesus whom we declare to be God's messenger and high priest. For he was faithful to God who appointed him, just as Moses served faithfully when he was entrusted with God's entire house. But Jesus deserves far more glory than Moses, just as the person who builds a house deserves more praise than the house itself. For every house has a builder, but the one who built everything is God. Moses was certainly faithful in God's house as a servant. His work was an illustration of the truths God would later reveal. But Christ as the Son is in charge of God's entire house, and we are God's house. If we keep our courage and remain confident in our hope in Christ, that is why the Holy Scripture says, Today when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts, as Israel did when they rebelled, when they tested me in the wilderness. There your ancestors tested and tried my patience, even though they saw my miracles for 40 years. So I was angry with them and I said, Their hearts always turn away from me. They refuse to do what I tell them. So in my anger, I took an oath. They will never enter my place of rest. That's down to the end of verse 11, actually. These verses start off by reminding us who we are, that we are brothers and sisters. Um, sometimes the Greek word uses uh, brethren, which just means family together, brothers and sisters. But I, quite the author quite quite states quite clearly, dear brothers and sisters who belong to God, he again is identifying who we are, who our heritage is, who is our father, that we, are, that we belong to God. In some of the manuscripts, it translates it as a holy people, holy brothers and sisters who belong to God. And look at that, and, and are partners with those called to heaven. That just reminds us of where our destiny lies. Whenever we trust God, whenever we have personal faith, that we have a home in heaven and that we will go there one day and that we are all the same as those who are ready here there and those who will meet us there. That is our heavenly family. It says, think carefully about this Jesus whom we declare to be God's messenger or apostle um, and high priest. Now, again, it's hard for us who don't come from a Jewish background maybe to grasp some of this. Um, when it says about high priest, you've got to remind yourselves of the structure of the priests, how there was a tribe of Levi who were the priests, who, those who served in the temple and the temple courts, those who carried out everything for the people um, in ceremonies. But then you had the high priest, the one who was like the chief of all the priests. He was the only one who could go once a year into the very most inner part of the temple, the Holy of Holies, the where the Ark of the Covenant was. He had to go in very carefully once a year. He sprinkled blood on the wings of the um, cherubims that went across the top of the Ark of the Covenant, sometimes called um, a seat. And, and he sprinkled that there an atonement seat for the sins, the unknown sins, the unconfessed sins of the nation so that the people would be made right with God. That was such a, a fearful job. Um, 
any other priest who went in would have been struck down dead. And there was such a fear that whenever that high priest went in, he went in with a rope tied around his waist. So that if anything did happen to him, if he was struck down by God or if he suddenly died, that the other priests wouldn't have to go in, they could pull him out. Such was their fear of God and of the, of the anger of God, but also of the, how, how right God was and how wrong the people were. But Jesus is declared as the new high priest, the one who goes in and breaks that sort of mystery, the one who atones for us, the atonement seat, who pays the ultimate price. So rather than the, the blood of an animal being sprinkled in that seat, it is Christ's blood that is sprinkled in that seat. So we are forgiven once for all sins. And again, that's why it's symbolic that whenever Jesus died on the cross, it talks about the temple curtain being torn in two from top to bottom. That curtain, a big, thick, heavy curtain, was what separated the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was, from the rest of the temple. And the image of it being torn in two from top to bottom is the image of God removing that barrier. Because Jesus has now died and taken away our sins, the barrier is gone. And again, it's just reminding us that Jesus is God's messenger or Messiah, or Apostle, and the High Priest, the perfect High Priest for us. It says this about Jesus in verse 2, For he was faithful to God who appointed him, just as Moses served faithfully when he was entrusted with God's entire house. Again, for us, not being from a Jewish background, an Israelite background, um, to understand the history, do you understand the importance of Moses' rule? How he led the people? Think back to Egypt. To whenever Moses led the people out from Egypt through the wilderness, through the Red Sea, through everything that they encountered. Um, Moses as well, remember how he used to go into the, the tent that was at the side, the tent of meeting before the tabernacle was formed. How he would meet with God and how he would come out with his face so radiant that he had to wear a veil to cover his face because the people were scared to look upon him. Moses was held in high esteem, but Moses was just a man with flaws and faults like everybody else, so much so that even Moses would not get to enter the promised land because of how he had disobeyed God, how he had been angry when he shouldn't have been angry, just how he, you know, his behavior. But yet, the people worship Moses as such. So we start to be taught here something about idols. Again, that was something very common uh, in the journey through the wilderness. There was the golden calf. And even whenever the people sinned again and Moses had to make a serpent to be lifted up, a verse which is reflected upon in John, in John 3, it says, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Again, the serpent was a, was a pagan symbol at one stage, but Jesus wanted them to recognise the futility of their idols. Uh, and those idols extended to people. Now maybe today we think, oh, I don't have idols. I don't worship um, something carved sitting in my house. I don't have an altar in my house. Um, I don't think of people that way. Yeah. Maybe that's true, and I hopefully it's not true. But there are a number of people for whom there are idols. An idol is some, simply something which takes the most important place in your life, um, the place that God should have. For some, it is maybe a possession. Maybe it's their house or a car. Maybe it's clothing. Maybe it's their looks. Maybe it's a sport or a particular team. Maybe it's a pastime. There are those things which are the most important in our lives. Things that we say that we must follow and that we must um, put in first place. And that's wrong. Because the only person who should have first place in our life is God. Now, these Israelites still held Moses in high esteem. And other apostles, other prophets in the past... The author wants him to realise actually it's Jesus and God who should be first place in your life. That's where the importance lies. And he points out that Moses was a servant who 
who faithfully served um, God's entire house. But goes on to say, but Jesus deserves far more glory than Moses, just as the person who builds the house deserves more praise than the house itself. Seems like maybe a strange analogy, but it's true. Um, You know, the person who builds the house is the one with the skill. What they've created is the house. So if you're going to thank anybody, you don't thank the house. You thank the person who's built your house for you. And that's the same with God. Why, why do we, we thank his creation rather than thanking God? Why do we worship the creation when we should be worshipping the creator? And that's what he's getting at. For every house is a builder, but the one who built everything is God. We look at creation in different ways. Um, we look at timelines in different ways. We look at what it means to create in different ways. But no matter what your understanding of creation is and timelines and all the rest, the one thing that we have to agree on is that God is the creator and the designer. He is the one who put the building blocks in place. Now, whether you believe God did all of that or whether God let things run for a while, um, we can argue that till the cows come home. But the one thing is God designed and created we can't deny that because uh, God is the one who is in control. It said Moses, in verse 5, Moses was certainly faithful in God's house as a servant. His work was an illustration of the truths God would later reveal. We've got to remember that the Bible tells us a story from start to finish. A story of God's, of his perfect nature, um, of how he wants to create something how that is corrupted, how that is changed by what he creates, but then his plan to put it right. So as we read the Bible, you know, we teach our children that we have 66 books in the Bible. Um, We've got 39 in the Old Testament, the rest in the New Testament, you know, and we teach them these things. Whereas actually the Bible is only one book Yes, it's broken down into different chapters or different settings, but it's one book. There is one story which runs from start to finish. Genesis is the beginning of that story. Revelation is the end of that story. And we have to hold it all together. Now, again, for us, some of it might seem strange because we're learning about Jewish laws and customs and what that meant. And we, for most of us, we're not Jews. We don't follow those customs and laws. But it gives us an insight into God's relationship with his people. It also shows us God's nature for how he so often tries to give the people another chance. And he points out to them where they're going wrong. And gives them every opportunity to turn away from their sin. And yet they keep on sinning. It shows that God is a patient God. But it also shows that God is a just God and that there has to be punishment for sin. Again, some people would say, oh, reading the Old Testament, oh, that's a God of wrath and anger. uh, And there must be um, sacrifice and account. Whereas the God of the New Testament is a God of love and peace. Um, Well, if you think God is a God of love and peace and everything will be rosy, you haven't read Revelation. You haven't read about the battle between good and evil and how evil is defeated in the end. You have missed that. There is one God. He runs right the way through. We just see different angles from his nature at times. We do see different parts of his personality, if you want to put it in a human term. But at all times, God never changes. and God is always just and demands justice and demands sinless perfection. So Moses was a faithful servant um, in the house of the Lord. His work is an illustration of the truth God would later reveal. But Christ is the son, this is verse 6, is in charge of God's entire house. So where Moses was a, was a servant in the house and you had different servants carrying out different roles, Jesus is in charge of the entire house. Jesus is in a different fitting. And we are, we are God's house if we keep our courage and remain confident in our hope in Christ, we are all 
We are, we are God's house. We are God's creation. Remember what it said that um, it's better, the one who does, builds the house deserves the praise rather than the house itself and that God is the one who built everything. So we are the house. We are what God has built. There is creation again. We are the work of his hands. If we keep our courage and remain confident and our hope in Christ, we need to follow the example of Jesus. We need to look at how he lived his life, why he did things, why he didn't do things, and we need to follow that example. Yes, yeah, sometimes we'll get it right, sometimes we'll get it wrong, but that's what we need to follow. Then in verses 7 to 11, we get a quote taken from Psalm 95, verses 7 to 11. Let me read those verses to you again. That is why the Holy Spirit says, Today when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as Israel did when they rebelled, when they tested me in the wilderness. There your ancestors tested and tried my patience, even though they saw my miracles for 40 years. That's why I was angry with them and I said, your hearts always turn away from me. They refuse to do what I tell them. So in my anger, I took an oath. And I will never enter my place of rest. God was speaking to his people in the wilderness, through Moses, through the actions of what they saw around them. They, they saw very clearly a pillar of smoke in front of them, which had fire in it at night. Uh, they saw how God's presence had descended onto the tabernacle whenever it was constructed and how it rose again to tell him to move. They could see God in their midst. They could see what he was doing for them. And yet, as this psalm says, they hardened their hearts to God. And God puts a plea out to us. Please don't harden your hearts. That's what the author is telling us. Don't harden your hearts today as Israel did when they rebelled, when they tested me in the wilderness. That's God speaking. When they tested me, that's God saying about his people in the wilderness. And, and pleading with us, don't turn from me. Follow me. Look at what I'm doing for you. Just open your eyes and just follow me. But the warning, I took in my anger, I took an oath, they will never enter my place of rest. God judged his own people. The people who were chosen, the people who were sacred, the people who would bless the rest of this earth, God judged them for their behaviour. He gave them every opportunity. It says, even though they saw my miracles for 40 years, God walked with them a long time, pleading with them to follow him. And yet, they still had idols. They still turned their backs on him. They still disobeyed the laws which he had given to them. They still went their own way. We like freedom and choice in every aspect of our life. Look at the number of supermarkets that we have um, between Tesco's and Asda and Lidl's and your local spa and Super Values, even Marks and Spencer's, Sainsbury's. You know, we've got choice upon choice and we choose where we will go and shop. Look at the centre of our town and the number of churches that we have in this town, even the number of Presbyterian churches that we have in this town. And we choose where we will go to worship and we will be, go to be connected. And if we don't like how one place does it, that's fine, we'll just go up and we'll move and we'll go somewhere else. We have choices in everything that we do in life. God has made us with free will. The one important choice is following God's and making that conscious decision to follow him. God doesn't force us. God will never force us. He'll never make us follow him. He lays the facts out in front of us and it's up to us to interpret and to choose what we do. Wow. That's a big responsibility God's put on our shoulders, isn't it? To choose to follow him or to choose not to follow him. To choose how we do it. But here's the thing. There's only one God. There's only one creator. There's only one person who has done all of this for us. 
And he's the one who is perfect. He's the one who is glorious. He's the one who wants us to be with him in heaven one day. He's the one who calls us his family as we look at that brothers and sisters who belong to God. We're his children. We're called his house, his creation. He just wants us to follow him. Even whenever we do decide to follow God, there is still a danger of things creeping into our lives and getting in front of God and being more important than God. Sometimes it is our church. Sometimes it is where we worship, our building, our fellowship. And we, we start to make it about ourselves. I don't like this and I don't like that and I don't do this and I don't do that. Or maybe I don't like that person who sits over there. We lose what it's about. We lose that it's about worshipping God. That means recognising who he is, the place that he should have in our lives and following him. We put things in front of God rather than behind him. So let me challenge us all with this thought now and I'm going to leave this thought with you. What is the most important thing in your life? Seriously, what is the most important thing? Think about that. And then think, if there was a choice that you had to either spend time with God or spend time doing that thing or with that person or in that place that, that you feel is most important in your life, who would win that contest? Would you spend time with God or with that person, object, sport, whatever it is? If God doesn't win that contest, then that's an idol in your life. Take this time now to say sorry for that idol and to ask God to help you to get him into the right place. It's not easy, it's difficult. But if you open yourself up to God, he will help you, he will guide you, he will direct you. Because he is a faithful God. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for all your goodness to us. Thank you for everything that you have given us. Everything comes from you. Help us always to put you in first place in our lives. Lord, forgive us now for those things which creep in in front of you at times. Help us to get it right. Help us to surrender to you. Help us to keep our eyes, our hearts, our minds firmly focused on you. Father, thank you. Go with us now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks, folks. Uh, God willing, we will finish off the rest of Hebrews chapter 3 next week. Take care. God bless. Bye.